We want, we want a token for our home. We want to bring our children under the token, and we'll talk more about that later. We want to bring everybody around us under the token, but there's got to be a true token. And it's got to be applied by faith. It's got to be real. It's got to be genuine. It's got to be the same token at church. It's got to be the same token at home. Because remember when we read in Exodus and we, we read also in Joshua that the token was for the home. That's why I, I'm so encouraged by the things that I see. I was here Wednesday night. And, and Wednesday night we played a tape. Many of you were here. We played a tape. We played the second part that we're listening to. It is the rising of the sun. And afterwards, we had a worship service. We started singing songs, and, and the worship was sweet. And then as we sang more songs, people trickled out one by one as they had need to go. And I sat over here because the atmosphere was good, and I just wanted to sit. And I was sitting there and worshiping, and pretty soon, you know, another would go, another would go, another would go, until I looked around, and the majority of who was sitting here worshiping, standing with their hands lifted up, was our young people. Teenagers and young adults. I say, thank you, God. There's something real in those homes. Because teenagers catch hypocrisy like that. I mean fast. And they won't stand for it. But when I looked around and I seen young men, young women, girls and boys, mom and dad's already gone. Sorry, young people, I don't say this to make you feel bad or make you feel awkward. But mom and dad was gone. Most of the adults were gone. But there's young people standing there, lifting their hands, eyes closed, heads up, worshiping God. That's what I want, something that produces reality. It's a token that brings something real into the hearts and lives of, of, of young people, our children. Amen. Not hypocrisy, not a double standard, not something that causes confusion and questioning. Amen. But something that they, they can look at and say, that's real. Amen. There's many, uh, many of you who are older than me has had to suffer with, with children. You've done everything right. You applied the token at home. You lived the word. Amen. And they still left. Amen. But, but don't believe that that token didn't take effect. Amen. Don't allow yourself to believe that. No matter what you see, amen, no matter what your eyes declare, don't doubt the fact that if you lived a genuine life before them, and I'm not talking about a perfect life, I'm talking about a genuine life. Not a double standard, not hypocrisy, but you know nobody lives a perfect life. Everybody fails and makes mistakes, but they saw repentance, they saw forgiveness, they saw a, a dad, a mom who would line back to the word and line back to the word and line back to the word. If they saw something genuine, if they saw a token on display, amen, don't ever doubt the power and effect that will have, friends. Amen, don't let the devil discourage you because when things get bad, amen, when things fall to pieces, they know what truth is and they know what reality is and they know where it was real. Remember the prodigal son had got away from his father's love. He had gone away from his father's house and under his father's protection and under his father's token. But when he got down to nothing, he knew, he knew he could go back to his father's house. There was no doubt that his father would be gone. There was no doubt that his father would have backslid. He had no doubt that father would have disappeared. He knew dad would be there because he must have seen something real in dad. There must have been a reality, a life, a genuineness where he knew that dad would be there doing what he's always done because dad is faithful. Amen, we have to have confidence in what God's given us this day. If we put the life on display, amen, and we've done all that, the, that God had required, and we've done it all with the best of our heart, with pure intentions, with pure motives, with our heart in the right place, don't, don't lose confidence in the power of the token. It doesn't matter what we see. We will see what we need to see in due season. We must believe the promise for our day. We must believe the word for this day and the power that that word brings and the life of that word, what it will produce. So I was encouraged on Wednesday night. Listen, friends, we played a tape. We played a tape. We didn't whoop it up. We didn't, we didn't preach it up. We played a tape. And we began to worship. And there was teenagers in Laodicea who would stay and raise their hands and worship God. 
We underestimate the power of the token. But let's not do it. Let's know what God has given us. Let's understand what God's put in our hand and let's have faith in it. Rahab had faith in that scarlet thread because it was, she was obeying what she was commanded to do. And when she did what they said do, took it and put it on display, amen, then she could go run around and gathering all her house and bringing them under her token because she had confidence that this token will hold. In the day of destruction, this will hold. Amen. The fathers who would paint the lintel and the doorpost, amen, in, in Egypt that day, they had confidence that the token would hold, that the death angel would pass. And we're in a day of destruction, friends, and then we see destruction all around us, but the destruction I'm worried about is not that kind of destruction where you lose money and there's wars and bombs are falling. The destruction I'm worried about is the destruction of souls, amen, where the death angel is coming in and bringing spiritual death into lives. What's the guard against that? Amen, you may raise a boy or a girl to be successful in this life. They may hold down a job. They may be good parents. They may be able to have a house and, and, and then pay their bills and be good citizens and do all of that. But if the death angel strikes spiritual death in their lives, what good did it do, friends? But what they need is they need to know what the token is and see it on display. This, this, this is the day for the manifestation of the token, not to talk about it, but to manifest the token. And it brings a power with it because it's the life of Jesus Christ. He said the word interpreted is the manifestation of the name of God. No wonder flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father which is in heaven has revealed this to you, who I am. And upon this rock I'll build my place of worship and the gates of hell can't shake it down, amen. A living church of God standing in firm foundation on Jesus Christ alone. You can sing the song, but if you're not on Christ the word, you're on teetering, faltering sand. But upon this rock, Christ my word. Let's go to Revelation 19. All of these are familiar scriptures but they mean so much to us. In this day that we live in, they're familiar, yes, we know what they say, but they mean so much to us. Let's not let them lose their meaning. Revelation 19, 11, and I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. He that sat upon him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. His name is called the Word of God. And the Word interpreted is a manifestation of the name. Is he Jesus Christ? Absolutely. But his name represents his person. His person represents his personal presence, and his personal presence is here with the Word. He came, when the word was restored, the life came back. And the presence of God is here among us. And the word interpreted is a manifestation of the name of God. The anointed ones at the end time. Brother Bram says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how oft I would, would I, from the beginning of time, not a third person, somebody else, but I, I would have hovered you as a hen did her brood, but you would not. But now your hour has come, see. Where the carcass is, the eagles will gather. But after the carcass is rotten, then the buzzards gather, see. Notice Moses, he never gave the children of God. Moses was an eagle, and he never gave the children of God Noah's leftovers. He had the fresh word of God. The, lo the Lord God met him in the wilderness and confirmed his word and sent him down there to call you to call you out. Then they're coming impersonators around, impersonating it, see? But he had the word of the hour. Because God said to Abraham, the one who had the promise, your seed shall sojourn in a strange land for 400 years, but I'll visit them and take them out with a mighty hand. Moses said, now the Lord God will speak to me and show me and has told me what to do. And I tell you, said, I am sent me. I am, not I was or will be, I am. The present tense, the word now, not the word that was or word that will come, the word that's now. See, you get it? I am. I am is the word. Let that statement soak in. 
I am is the word. He said, not, not the word that was or the word that will be. I am is the word. If I want the word in the life of the word, I have to find the I am. That I am is the word. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God. Is that right? I am. God sent me as his prophet to vindicate this to be true. I am the answer to this word. To this word told me, come down here and do this. And when he did it, Pharaoh said, well, we got plenty of boys in our group can do that too, impersonators. Jesus said, now that's going to repeat again in the last days. See, claiming the same thing. Watch who come down first. Watch who stayed with the word. That's it. That's how it's known. See, you see? We notice Moses never give them what was Noah's time. We'll build an ark now because that's the word. You know, Noah built an ark one day. No vultures was eating on that. Let's think now. Think of today. He said Moses couldn't say, you know, let's build an ark. Uh, uh, and that, that's the word. It, it was the word. Amen. It, it, what is the word is always the word. That's the eternal word of God. He told Noah to build an ark. But that word was for that day. And he could not bring it to this day. He said buzzers was feeding on that. But he started off this by saying, where the carcass is, there where the eagles will gather, not buzzards. Vultures was eating on that. No, no, no. This is a promised word. Notice, for this message he had from God, he had the genuine predestinated word of God for that hour. Neither did Jesus serve them Moses' leftover. Moses had the word for that hour, but Moses was a prophet. Here is God himself. See, he never served them Moses' leftover. You know how offensive that kind of statement was to the Jews? They studied Moses and they had the word of Moses and it was the word of God. It's what God gave them. It's what God gave them to move them forward in the program of God. Amen. The word always came to move them forward in the program of God. He would send a fresh word for that day. The eagles would gather that word and he would move forward his program. Amen. The problem was not that that was good word. The problem was when they moved forward, amen, the life was always in the present tense word. The fresh kill of the word with the blood, with the life was always in present tense. Amen. But when they would go back to the old and vultures would go back to that. And you know how offensive that was to the Jews. It's just offensive today when say we're not going back to Pentecostal teaching. We're not going back to Baptist teaching. We're not going back to Catholic teaching. Amen. The buzzers are feeding on that. But where the carcass is, the eagles will gather. That's an offensive statement to many, but if they would just turn and look at it differently, it's the most liberating statement in the world because there's a place today, there's a fountain today, there's a bleeding word today, bleeding out life. And his name is in the word, and the word interpreted is the manifestation of his name. Amen, you can have him and know him and unite with him and have his name when you have the word interpreted for your day. What's been given to us? Everything we need. Neither did Jesus serve them. Moses left over. Moses had the word for that hour, but Moses was a prophet. Here is God himself. He never served them. Moses left over. But just look at the vultures there in that organization was glutting over it. We know. We got Moses. We don't have to have you. He said, if you'd have known Moses, you would know me because Moses spake of me. Oh, my Where the carcass is, the eagles will gather. Eagles, the fresh kill of the word. Here's another one of Brother Benham's statements, and I want it to be not just a statement we've heard, but I want it to come home now this morning like it's never come home before. He's talking about the bleeding word, a bloody word, a dripping word, and he's talking about the fresh kill of the word. Amen. It all, all these statements go together. Where the carcass is, the eagles will gather. Eagles, the fresh kill of the word. The word that raised up and, and fattened and made, and made manifest and give out to the food for the children. Now the old carcass that's laid there for hundreds of years, there it'll be. Same now, Luther had a message of repentance. But you bunch of Lutheran buzzards. Baptist had a message, but you Baptist buzzards. See, the Pentecost had a message, come home now, Pentecostal buzzards. But where the carcass is, there the eagles will gather. Remember, you couldn't feed Lutheran back in them days, uh, Catholic Icarian. No, sir, he had fresh meat. That was that church age. 
You couldn't feed Methodist Lutheran message. Oh no, he didn't want that carrying. It's rotten. See, the life had done left it and went into something else. But that's the old stalk that's dead back there. The life is moving on. Neither can you feed the bride of Jesus Christ Pentecostalism. No indeedy, maggot blown organization, nothing doing, no, no. For the promise is, and before that great and terrible day shall come, I will send unto you Elijah the prophet. He will restore the hearts of the children back to the faith of the fathers again. All these promises have been made in the Bible. I will do it, and there the eagles will gather. All that the Father has given me will come to me. Where will the eagles gather? Wherever that Elijah ministry brought us back to the faith of the fathers. And there, the word has been restored, and the mystery of God has been unveiled, amen, and the eagles will feed on the fresh kill of the word, and the fresh kill of the word is a bloody word. There's a token available from the bloody word. Let's turn to Matthew 24. Matthew 24, and we'll start at verse 27. Matthew 24 and 27, for as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even into the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For wheresoever the carcass is, there will the eagles be gathered together. This is where Brother Ben was talking about this scripture and where the carcass is, the eagles will be gathered. And you can find it again in Luke 17. But when you read this, it, it reminded me of a verse in Job. If you'll turn with me back to Job. Job 39. Job 39 and 27. Doth the eagle mount up at thy command and make her nest on high? She dwelleth and abideth on the rock, upon the crag of the rock and the strong place. Now listen, friends, take this home. Where does the eagle go? On high. The eagle maketh her, she abideth on the rock, the rock of revelation upon the crag of the rock and the strong place. Because Christ is a, uh, he's a mighty tower. The word of the Lord is a tower that the righteous run into and are safe. From thence she seeketh to pray, in her eyes behold afar off. Her young ones also suck up the blood, and where the slain are, there is she. This is the same thing that they're saying over in Matthew where the carcass is, there the eagles will gather. But I thought it was so interesting, the description of the eagle that God is giving to Job. Amen. The, the eagle mounts up on high uh, on the rock, on the crag of the rock, on the strong place. From there she seeketh her prey. Where does she seek her prey? From the, the high rock of revelation where she can see. Her young ones also suck up blood. And where the slain are, there she is. Where the carcass is, the eagles are gathered. And I want to I wanna say, her young ones, amen, she's taken her young ones to the fresh kill. She has taken her young ones to the fresh kill of the word or brought the fresh kill of the word back to her young ones. But her young ones, amen, as they're feeding on the fresh kill of the word, are sucking up the blood. And in our homes, amen, we want to feed our children the right diet, amen, so that they can receive the blood. We want to give them the fresh kill of the word for this day. Amen, we want to talk about the message. We want to demonstrate the message. We want to live out the message before them. We want to bring them the fresh kill of the word so that our children can be feeding on the fresh kill of the word and that they can suck up the blood because this is a bleeding word, friends. The, eagle, the eaglets can take it, amen. The eaglets can receive it, amen. The eaglets, of all the ages and all the anointings on the ages, you have lion and ox and man and eagle. Lion, ox, and man start on milk, but a little eagle starts on meat, amen. 
Eaglets can handle the meat. It may be a smaller portion. It may be bite-sized. They may not be able to take the portion that mama eagle can, but they start on meat and they drink up the blood. And in our homes and with other people, amen, let's give them the fresh kill of the word. Because it has the blood. The fresh kill of the word is the bleeding, bloody word. The word that's bleeding. The fresh kill of the word has the life of the word in it. In the message, the oddball, Brother Bram says, I don't believe I was ever in any sweeter worship and fellowship. Brother Bram's gonna start talking, he's gonna start talking about atmosphere. He says, I don't believe I was ever in any sweeter worship and fellowship as these songs and things that I sat there and bit my lips and shake my feet and try to hold myself back from screaming out when I heard those old songs sang in the way I think they ought to be sung. And that's sung in the spirit. <laughs> and that's the way they ought to be sung. Sung in the spirit. Now, that's why Paul said, if I sing, I'll sing in the spirit. Now, I can't imagine the spirit as being screaming to the top of our voice. I think the spirit of Christ is love and gentleness and peace. And that brings something to our souls that feed us. I think there, that's the way them songs should be sang. I'm going to go back and read this again. Because he's talking about the old songs that sung right in the right way. They're sung in the spirit. And he says, I... And, he's, and he quotes Paul, if I sing, I'll sing in the spirit. Now, I can't imagine the spirit as being screaming to the top of our voice. I think the spirit of Christ is love, gentleness, and peace. And that brings something to our souls that feed us. I think there, that's the way them songs should be sang. And to be here with you, I, I dedicated people to a cause, cause of Christ. There are just so many things I could say that time would, wouldn't permit me. I come, I thought, well, I'll run up and visit Brother Leo and the church up there and the portion of the body of Christ that's waiting for his coming and part of the bride that's sojourning here. And how you've separated yourself from the rest of the world and come over here to live this way. I was thinking, even the little creek, you're on the side of Jordan now. You're in the land here. You're come over on an exodus coming out of the world into a place where you can congregate yourselves together and worship God really according to the dictates of your conscience. And that's what we stand for. As a democracy, as a nation, we stand for the, this very thing that each man can worship. And it's just too bad we don't have more like this. That's right. Where that let the world be in their place and God's people in their place where we can have this. And I certainly, if I said amen and walked out the door, I'd say it would pay me every Sunday to drive up here or have my children even to come up to set under an atmosphere like this because it's always the atmosphere that brings the results. Remember, we want the token applied for the home. And, and Brother Bam's talking about a church, a small group that was set aside. And they'd separated from the world. Amen. He, he loved the worship and the consecration and the dedication and the separation. And they had a right atmosphere that he wanted to get his children into that atmosphere. Because it's always the atmosphere that brings the results. You can lay a seed out there in the ground, no matter how much that seed is germatized and lay it there, it's got to have an atmosphere to make it live. That sun has got to come a certain power before and bring it to a certain atmosphere. An egg has to have an atmosphere or it won't hatch. No matter how fertile it is, it's got to have that atmosphere. And I think that in a group like this, Christians hatch out, are born again in such an atmosphere as this. That encourages me because we can set an atmosphere. We can set an atmosphere around us. We can set an atmosphere in our homes. We can set an atmosphere as we gather here in the church. And if there's a, if there's a fertile egg there under the right atmosphere, it'll hatch out. And Brother Benham said, in a group like this, Christians hatch out, are born again in such an atmosphere as this. This kind of atmosphere I was born under. No matter where I go and visit, the cold world and mission fields and so forth, I can even stand and close my eyes and think of this atmosphere. This reminds me when I was just a boy preacher and just starting out, we had a little groups to meet from house to house. We separated ourselves from the things of the world too. That's what made my heart the way it is today in love with Christ where we can dwell together. Listen, Brother Ben put a lot of emphasis on atmosphere. And you cannot, you cannot create a seed gene of God in your children. 
You can't do it. If it's there, it was there before the foundation of the world. You can't fertilize the egg once the egg's already out. But if there's a seed there, if there's a fertile egg there, if you keep it in the right atmosphere, it'll hatch out. Atmosphere is so important. He said, doesn't matter how fertile the egg is in the wrong atmosphere. Brother Branham said, I would have given my heart to the Lord earlier, but I rung with the wrong crowd. It kept me from it. He was in the wrong atmosphere. But when he got in the right atmosphere, he was born again. And we want to keep the right atmosphere here as we congregate together as a church. As we when Brother Branham came and he preached the token, amen, when he got the desperation, he said, we've talked about the token all along, but now is the manifestation of the token. The token. Did the token take effect on you? Yes, it did. Will the token in your life take effect on somebody else? Yes, it will. I want to have confidence in that token because the token's for the home. Let's go to Galatians chapter 2. We'll lead, read this scripture and then we'll be done. Galatians chapter 2. Galatians 2 and verse 20. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. This life of Christ is to be lived in the flesh. And I say, Lord, live it in this flesh here. We found the bleeding word. Are you confident of that? Have you found the bleeding word? Have you feasted on the word? Have you ate his flesh and drank his blood? If you've ate his flesh and drank his blood, then his life is in you. And if you've been crucified with Christ, you, you live, but not you. It is Christ that liveth in you. And that life is a token on display. It's got to be applied. It's got to be on the display. But if it is, It'll take effect. Amen. Let's all stand. Musicians, if you'd come. I want the word to take effect in my life. We don't light, put the light under a bushel basket, but we put it on a hill for all to see. And that's the life of Christ on display. We live it. I see it in you. I see it in your families. I see it in your lives. But don't doubt the effect of that token being on display. It'll save. If, you can, if somebody can come under the token, under the same token, with the same faith, and come under the token, they'll be saved too. We're out there. We, we, may, you know, we may be running around and saying, come. Maybe all of Rahab's family didn't come. Maybe they did, maybe they didn't. I don't know. I don't know how many came, how many friends, how many associates. But you know what? Some came. We, don't, we can't control everything, but one thing I can believe is that the token will have an effect, that the life of Christ will have an effect on the seed of Christ. And I don't want to doubt that. I don't want to forsake that. I don't want to hinder that in any way. Is that your prayer? Amen. Lord, just flow. I know many, because we know situations, many have children that have left the message, left the truth, left. And there is a prodigal out there. Amen. For I will take you from the nations and bring you to your own land, and I'll be sanctified in you before the eyes of a new heart will I give you and place my spirit within. I'll sprinkle clean water on you and save you from your sin. There is a fountain open in the house of David.
and I will pour upon the house of my chosen one the spirit of grace.